Welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana, and I'm here again live. So if people want to call in with questions, you are certainly welcome to. Um, my guest today is Justin Paglino, uh, who is running for Congress in the New Haven area in the 3rd uh, Congressional District. He ran in 2020 and is running again on the Green Party line. So um, welcome, Justin. Thank and you, Rana. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, I guess I want to start out by, you know, asking you to talk a little bit about your background and why two years ago you decided that running for this kind of office was the right thing to do. Uh, well, my background is in medicine and medical science. So I went to Brown University uh, and then Brown University School of Medicine and then I graduated, I went to Yale University for two years of clinical pathology residency, which is blood banking, chemistry, uh, hematology, immunology. Um, and uh, I, I then went into research. I, I decided I was interested in medical research. So I joined what's called the Investigative Medicine Program at Yale, which is uh, like a PhD for MDs, people who already have their MD and want to go and get the PhD. Uh, and it was a great program, and I took uh, courses, and I went into a lab, and I wrote uh, a paper and a thesis and got my PhD. And then, uh, and then I, I was enjoying research, and I kept going. I wanted to keep doing it. Uh, I was studying oncolytic viruses, which are viruses that infect cancer cells, and trying to get uh, viruses to do a good job of distinguishing between cancerous and non-cancerous cells so that if you use them as a treatment, they would do a good job of infecting the cancer but not the, the healthy tissue. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I did that for a long time. Uh, I did the postdoc for about 10 years. Uh, I got a grant from the National Cancer Institute for five years of research. Um, and that was a grant to uh, investigate uh, use of a specific virus VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus, to uh, try and generate an immune response against a tumor in a live animal, uh, combined with some of the newer uh, antibodies they have now that help stimulate immune responses against tumors, um, anti-CTLA4 -CTLA and uh, things like that. So uh, they call them checkpoint inhibitors. So <laughs> anyway, um, they... Uh, the, I got the grant, I did the research, I pursued my hypothesis, but it didn't really uh, work as well as I had hoped. I saw some tumors regressing and mm, a lot of tumors not regressing. And, um, you know, it, it, it didn't generate the data I needed to really generate a paper. Um, you know, at, at, at some point I decided I was kind of ready for a life change, a career change, you know, we only go around once. And there were a lot of things on my back, you know, in the back of my mind that I wanted to be doing that I never had time for between uh, work and uh, two kids, uh, two cats, plus we just got a dog today, I was telling you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the growing household. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I've always cared about fairness and I've cared, and so I've always cared about politics and about um, people getting a fair shake, and about um, you know people not getting away with uh, crooked, underhanded dealing, so to speak, <laughs> and getting away with pollution, polluting the environment, 
you know, that stuff has always irked me, I guess you could say. <laughs> so um, I, de I, uh, I decided I was going to go more full time into activism and also music because I play piano. And so I have several students now that I teach piano and a ukulele student. And, <laughs> um, and I play in several, in a couple of bands right now, a few different bands. Now, when so, I originally met you, I think it was through like Medicare for All, like healthcare advocacy. And uh, I don't think you immediately were thinking, oh, I'm going to run for Congress. But then, of course, in early 2020, COVID happened. And it seemed as though, I don't know, we really needed more people with political power um, to to plot a, a, a course forward who had knowledge of the science of what we need to do to be effective. Yeah, for, the, for COVID. Yeah, we had kind of a, uh, you know, Anthony Fauci, by and large, I think, um, what I put a lot of credibility behind him, even though I know it be, he's become a lightning rod and a very controversial uh, figure. And I disagree with some of what he said. The initial thing where he said, Oh, masks only protect you, uh, you know, if masks only protect other people. If you're sick, you should wear a mask, but they won't protect you if you're not sick. And he had to walk that back because and when he first said that, I was talking to some other MDs and we were all looking at each other, scratching our heads like that seems like a strange thing to say. And I think he later walked it back and said, well, we were worried that there would be a run on surgical masks and then there wouldn't be enough left for um, people in hospitals. And that's a bit of a political, uh, you know, that's kind of playing politics and not, and not playing straight. So I'm not saying I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan, you know, like some fanatic. I try to t assess people uh, accurately with the positives and their negatives. I'm just saying that in a lot of ways on the science, um, he spoke pretty eloquently about the science of what was known and what is not known. I mean, that's what you do in science is you try to measure your words carefully, be as, you know, not overstate the case, um, unlike politicians sometimes who are always trying to make things sound. <laughs> well, I do think in, in science, people think of science as like having answers, but really it's like more like an ongoing methodology to keep getting more and better answers. Yeah, science is, is not about knowing all the answers, for sure. Science is about being very careful not to assume you know anything unless you can really have good evidence that you do. So it's really more about that. It's about making sure you remember what you don't know. <laughs> well, you know, that seems like a... Um... I keep saying the epidemic of our time. I mean, COVID is bad and monkeypox is bad, but Dunning-Kruger, you know, people who don't know enough to know what they don't know are maybe the biggest danger we, fa we face. Well, you know, it's interesting. Science literacy is important. And, uh, you know, obviously science education is important and people need to um, understand the scientific method, but I think there's also a challenge of communicating that falls on the scientific community of trying to communicate science to the public in a way that that is clear, transparent, understandable, credible. Um, yeah, probably not lost in lingo, which I think might happen. Lost in lost in lingo, yeah. or you know, because there is a certain amount of 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 um, experience and you know, to become an expert in a field, you have to dedicate your life to it. And so the common person is not going to be able to under, understand everything that an expert understands, not just in science, but in everything. You know, if my car mechanic tried to teach me car mechanics in a day, you know, I would be lost, right? Um, so that we had a lot of people trying to understand all the details. And I think at some point you do, you have to understand that you can't learn virology in a weekend, you know, and there are such things as experts. And but it is it is fair to want to uh, understand what are the credentials of this person? How reliable are they? Can I trust them? Um, and at some point you do have to trust. You have to do have to find people you can trust. And that's 
kind of a drama we saw playing out throughout the pandemic. You know, Fauci was one of the lightning rods. You know, do we trust him? Do we not trust him? Um, <clears throat> but um, certainly you want to start with someone who has background in virology, I would say, <laughs> and medicine. Um, right. Because there were a lot of non-medical people with a lot of opinions. And, you know, I, I think it really, and we'll talk more about the healthcare system in general, but I think one of the problems that we have in our healthcare system is that people don't trust it because it's be healthcare has kind of become a commodity. It isn't really about healthcare. You know, the hospitals, even if they're technically nonprofit hospitals, when they consolidate, the CEOs are making big bucks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they are, they're kind of selling a product. And, uh, and people, of course, are often fighting with their insurance companies or having trouble getting the medications they need because there are so many gatekeepers and people kind of lining their pockets along the way. And so I think we got set up when this pandemic started of a lot of people who were not inclined to trust the medical profession and they didn't really know whom to trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think there is a problem that we don't have we don't have um, you know th there's a lot of suspicion about government in general um, or there's a lot of suspicion about government and of private for-profit corporations sure. being corrupt right and and having their own interests that they're holding first and foremost whether it's the government uh, whether it's the hospital you're going to, or so, even the doctor you're going to, people worry, you know, that they're, they're the doctor's trying to make money and uh, and 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 they're biased by money, and money can bias people. So, how do you set up? How do you set up a government that uh, that that people trust? I mean, I've been starting with government. I've been a, uh, in favor of public campaign finance reform for, you know, decades, forever. It always was clear to me that, uh, you know, the, the obvious influence of money throughout our politics uh, isn't just bad for um, our political outcomes, but it's bad for our people's faith in democracy because they look at, they look at what um, wins elections and they see that it's money. You know, my opponent is, can easily raise a million dollars. You know, I, I have no hope of doing that. There's no public financing available to me. Right. Um, you know, and uh, so whoever can raise the most money gets their ideas and their voice amplified the most. And it's unfortunate. Um, so, you know, that's one of the many reasons I decided to join the Green Party because we are a non-corrupt party. We do <laughs> live on our values. Sometimes that's about all we have to live on, too. <laughs> and it is frustrating that, uh, our, and it is true, the donors we have, it's a fairly, it's a fairly broad base of, of small donors, but uh, we don't take the corporate money and we don't take uh, the special interest money. Uh, and I do feel as though even when I talk to people who say, oh, the Green Party, doesn't have a chance of winning anything, they almost always say, yes, but the Green Party does have integrity. And we do. <laughs> we do. So it, it, it's tough. So uh, two years ago, you decided to run for Congress, mm -hmm. and you actually had to get a lot of signatures in the middle of a pandemic to get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. How did that work out? Uh, well, it, it, in the end, it worked out well. It was difficult. Uh, I had to, you know, I had some help from Green Party uh, volunteers in the state. Um, I had just joined the party in May, uh, you know, well over the winter of the prior year. I'd been a Democrat my whole life and I came to a point of realization that I wanted to really um, be in a party that was true to my values, that would not support the two-party system, which is corrosive, and, uh, and I learned about ranked choice voting, which we'll talk about later that would enable to, us to have more than two parties. And I said, well, you know, let's, that's the future. That's where 
hope really is, I think, and, and that's what makes sense to me. And so I joined the Green Party. I met several people. They helped me get the signatures I needed. We went to parking lots. Uh, you know, we, you know, we stood in on, on street corners. We went to some events, but there weren't many events. You know, there were Black Lives Matter events happening that summer, and um, those were good. Um, I've also done some petitioning this year. It's been easier. Um, more people are out. More people are comfortable. Um, and what's always encouraging is when you see there are a lot of people you find that are enthusiastic about yeah. wanting to see the Green Party on the ballot. Um, and a lot of them will vote for them. And some of them just say, well, it's just, it's just dem democracy to have more right. than two parties on the ballot. And, you know, whether I vote for you or not, it doesn't matter. I want to see that competition. And that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of thing that people are hungry for is more of a competition of ideas and not just a pick, pick one ballot. I I, I've been looking sort of not real scientifically at voter turnout in New London. Um, over the last 20 years, New London has become pretty much a democratic monopoly town. The last couple elections, all of the elected positions, 15 elected positions, have all been taken by Democrats. And as that has happened, the voter turnout has dropped mm -hmm. because they're just isn't as much dialogue. It's almost like you vote for your sports team mm -hmm. and there you don't get an understanding of issues. There aren't many opportunities for people to communicate with their elected officials exactly what's important to them. And so I, I feel as though if you have more choices, you know, in, in 2011, it was the first time New Londoners had voted for a mayor in like, I don't know, like 60 years or something, 70, 60, 70 years. And um, the voter turnout, there were six people who ran for that. There were the Democrat and the Republican. There wasn't a Green. There was a very um, high profile write-in candidate, the, the guy who had lost the Democratic primary, and then three petitioning candidates of various political persuasions. And that really drummed up a lot of interest. So there were close to 4,500 people who voted. Uh, last year, 2021, 10 years later, um, barely 3,000 people voted. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a mayoral year, that might have been part of it. But part of it was, everyone knows, oh, well, the Democrats are going to win. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, my vote isn't going to mean much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a, been a lot less discussion of issues, which, you know, fewer forums, fewer mm -hmm. debates, fewer dialogues even on the street corners. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'll just throw this in there, but there's a lot of talk. You hear a lot of people saying, where did Donald Trump come from? Like, how did we get here? What brought us to this point? And January 6th. Like, what has brought us here? Um, and I think Trump and January 6th are both um, symptoms of people losing faith in our democracy. And I think people have been losing faith in our democracy um, for a long time as they see the growing influence of money. I mean, the amount of money spent on elections has just been going up and up and up and up. It gets, you know, bigger every year. Um, and. Uh, you know, you saw Obama say, oh, I'm going to do the public campaign financing and then back out. Say, There's too much private money. I'm just going to use that. Um, but also the two-party system that forces you to pick one of two slots or having one party, like you're saying, be dominant and your vote doesn't mean anything um, because we don't have proportional representation, which is another uh, electoral yeah. reform that the Green Party is advocating, which would be multi-member districts where if you are represent, your party has maybe 10% support in, an, yeah. in um, an area, you could maybe get 10% of the legislature or something. That, right. That's the Unlike the winner takes all thing that if you have 55% of the support, you get 100% of the re representation. Yeah. And people are get frustrated with the Senate for having an imbalance of 
representation. They get frustrated with the electoral college. Um, and those get discussed a lot. But what doesn't that get discussed enough, I think, in terms of people losing faith in democracy is this two-party system. Uh, and people, when you grow up with it, you kind of take it for granted. I mean, I was, we all grew up with it. It's like, well, there's sure. this side and the, the, that side. Oh, this is easy. I'll just pick which one do I like. Oh, I like that one and I'll just register as that, and I'll always vote that, and I don't even have to think about politics anymore because <laughs> I know what I am, and you know, hey, politics in America is easy, but it makes it too easy, it makes it too simple, and it, it kind of dumbs it down. Um, John Adams said he uh, feared the division of the Republic into two great parties would be the greatest evil under our Constitution. That's a pretty accurate quote, or wow. paraphrase. And I love that paraphrase because that's where we are. Our country has fallen into the trap that Adams was afraid of. We're in this point where we're these two warring factions. But a lot of people are just, you know, tuning on, uh, tuning in, turning on, dropping out, so to speak. You know, right. they're just done with it. They feel like, and I meet these people, you know, when I am gathering petitions, they're like, oh, I don't vote. Oh, it doesn't matter how I vote. Um, a lot of people are losing faith in democracy. And so you get to Donald Trump, and to me, what he represents is, remember the Republican primary had like, you know, 10, 11 Wait. establishment Republican candidates all rejected, and Trump is the strong man. He's, he's, the, uh, he's the disruptor. He's gonna come in, and you know, he's got a lot of money, and he's just really, strong-headed and he's going to do whatever it takes to deliver for the people. He's, and you hear his supporters say things like, only he can fix this. And that means democracy can't fix this. That means they've lost faith in democracy. And so I think a lot about electoral reform and I really want to see it uh, push forward because um, the worse the Republican Party gets, um, the lower the bar is for what people are willing to support uh, in a Democrat. Yeah. And, and some people can't, can't stomach holding their nose for s such a low bar. At some I, I was actually really upset after Roe v. Wade was um, overturned that Governor Lamont kind of did a sales pitch to businesses, come move to Connecticut because we respect reproductive rights. And I'm absolutely in favor of respecting reproductive rights. However, it almost sounded like he was happy that other states were really bad because without doing anything different in Connecticut, we suddenly looked better. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are a lot of ways we could make, legitimately make Connecticut more business friendly. Uh, a universal health care so that small business owners or entrepreneurs wouldn't have to worry about how they 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 and their employees would be able to get health coverage. I wouldn't that be a fantastic boost to get young people to stay here if past their twenty sixth birthday or like for their whole lives they didn't have to worry about like catastrophic illness and medical related bankruptcy or lack of access to health care at all or any prescriptions they need. But instead of doing something that would really be transforming, it's well, at least you know, we're 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 make, keeping it legal for women to get abortions, which is the right where, right place to go, but we could be so much better than that. Yeah. The, the bar is lowered all the time, and you don't have anyone in, in generally in legislatures really calling out the Democrats from their left, or the Democratic positions, or the leader, because they're all the same party. So that's, the, that's a structural problem in our politics, um, is that, you know, for example, Pramila Jaipal has the Medicare for All bill in the yeah. U.S. House, and it's got a lot of co-sponsors. But, you know, like, but she still will support Nancy Pelosi as being the, the Speaker of the House. And, she'll st and she will not speak ill of Nancy Pelosi for, um, you know, not too harshly, uh, for never bringing it to a vote, for never, 
know, she'll say things, some slogans, some cheerleading a little bit here and there, but she won't really, she's not free to really dig into her own party's leader on this issue, where just having one green member of Congress, you know, would be great, would have just one person there who isn't bound by that party loyalty to criticize the party from the left, say, why aren't you supporting universal health care, which, you know, your your own, your your party used to support, Nancy yeah. Pelosi used to support. Yeah, when she was starting out, she was a real proponent yeah. of universal health care. Yeah. <laughs> so was Joe Courtney, by the way. I, I, I remember the first time he ran, and uh, I think his wife might be a nurse, and he made a grand statement at one of the debates that he would not accept the insurance that members of Congress get until um, co the country passed, like, universal health care. Joe Courtney. Joe Courtney. Yeah. Uh, he, he'd stay on his wife's insurance. Because he's not a co-sponsor. But <laughs> after um, the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. that was good enough for him, even yeah. though Obama even buckled on the public option piece of it. Yes, he did. Um, it became, that passed and Joe Courtney said, good enough. And now he says, oh, everyone really wants universal health care, but it's impossible. And I, I just can't buy that. It's like, how many countries around the world manage universal health care? And the United States has five different that I can count, maybe there are even more, public health care systems within the United States. We have the Veterans Administration, we have TRICARE for the active military, we have Medicare, we have Medicaid, we have Indian Health Service. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're all non-profit, publicly, in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, VA is more like what Great Britain has, the National Health Service, and I think maybe the Indian Health Service is also, and some are, are just, you know, pay, you know, public payers, not public health right. systems. Because the VA hospitals are owned by the government. Too. Right. Yeah. So those doctors are government employees, whereas that's obviously not true with Medicare. Yeah. Uh, so, but we have so many models we could actually choose from here that for people to say it's impossible, I, I just... I just don't buy it. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, no, it's not impossible. Of course it's possible. There's lots of countries that have universal health care. All of our peers, you know, all of the advanced nations have some form of either um, a mix of public and private to fill in the gaps, which we don't have. You know, we people, you may imagine that Medicaid is filling in all the gaps, or but it's not. There are, um, there are millions of people uninsured and there are millions more who are underinsured, who don't have uh, enough insurance to cover their um, their expenses or can't afford to cover their expenses. And you know, it, I think it's maybe 40% in one survey of people who delay getting health care because they're afraid of the cost, or put off, you know, can't uh, make an appointment or pay for their medicine. You know, they have to choose between medicine and food. This kind of thing doesn't happen in other countries. They make sure that everyone's getting <laughs> health care, regardless, you know, of their financial status. It's it's really obscene in a moral sense. And so, yes, it's 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 entirely possible. And not only is it possible, but as I point out all the time, because it's more efficient, it's it would be uh, would realize a cost savings. It's not an it's not like something that costs more than the current system. It's something that costs less. And in <laughs> fact, in Connecticut, um, it, we're one of two states that has a publicly administered Medicaid program. Uh, Dan Malloy, Governor Malloy, about 10 years ago, when he got into office after many years of Republican administrations, kind of wanted to make a splash. And some health care you know, advocates and disability rights advocates convinced him that there a really big way to make a splash would be to kick private interests out of Medicaid. So they got rid, the, Connecticut got rid of that middle risk management by private companies layer, mm. 
took on its own risk uh, and Medicaid in Connecticut is publicly administered and millions of dollars have been saved. Yeah. And patients have a better, I, I've heard there are problems and private interests are kind of nibbling away at it, mm. uh, but there isn't that same rate of denial of services that a, a doctor might recommend because there isn't that that for-profit gatekeeper function in the middle of it, and we're actually spending less. Yeah, um, and you know, a lot of the, that extra money that we're spending uh, for privately administ administered uh, healthcare is going to insurance company, um, insurance company profits, middlemen, I mean it. I guess shareholders too in some cases. Shareholders, right? the profits go to shareholders if they're public yeah and you know another the, those interests are very powerful they have such um, power in Washington DC uh, when these things are discussed they're all of a sudden they're there at the table with their opinions and their policy papers and they um, you know they uh, are always trying to get more they're not even happy with the right. slice they have, as you and I, as you and I know, yeah. pr you know, traditional public Medicare is being privatized right now, and this is an outrage that no one is talking about again because of the two-party system. I really think there's no one who is, you know, anyone in the Democratic Party is afraid to call out Joe Biden for doing this. He's privatizing right. Medicare, but people in his own party. You know, if they go after him, they will, you know, they'll be a pariah. They'll be, you know, exiled from their own party and probably primaried in the full weight of the party used to get to kill them. So they don't do it. So you need someone who's in a different party to criticize the Democrats from the left. Has to be a different party. It has to be, which is unfortunate because this privatization uh, trend that we're in now started under Trump. And yeah. I don't understand why the Democrats don't say Trump started this, it's really bad, let's l reverse course a little, but we're not seeing that. Well, uh, that's because <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes their donors happy, they're, and they're getting away with it. You know, <sighs> I've become quite cynical about the Democrats. I used to think that they, you know, and scratch my head, why aren't they doing more? Like, why don't they, you know, you know, don't they care? Not, not always. Yeah. I, I was a Democrat <laughs> for 30 years. Yeah, me too, you know. And then in 2004, largely due to local things, uh, as much as na on the national front, it's like I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, other than health care, can you name just a couple other issues that you feel like the Green, you and the Green Party differ quite starkly from both the Democrats and the Republicans? Um, so other issues. Well, you know, foreign policy is definitely one um, because there seems to be a Washington, they call it the Washington consensus <laughs> of foreign policy that it doesn't seem to matter who the president is. The foreign policy doesn't change much. I had a Republican friend who told me that once, you know, he was very Republican. I was Democrat. Obama was elected. We were working in the same lab. And he said, you know, what I like about Obama is he hasn't really changed the foreign policy. It's really just basically the same. And you thought, <laughs> uh-oh. <laughs> I had to admit, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, because the drones, you know, they, the drone warfare continued. And um, so I think we don't talk enough about um, our, our aggression, particularly, you know, our ongoing wars, Without congressional approval, we're not, you know, we're bombing seemingly in any country we choose without Congress needing to get involved. These strikes are not always uh, without civilian casualties. We're killing innocent civilians in many cases. And they say, well, you know, we try to avoid that, but they still do it. You know, you could yeah. not bomb and completely avoid it for sure. Um, but that would, that would necessitate trying to find you know, political solutions to these, to the issues that foment terrorism. And of course, the, the now um, 
The second piece of that is the environmental damage that's done by this kind of foreign policy. Oh, yeah. So we're in climate crisis now, and... So, yeah, the, the U.S. military is um, one of the largest emitters of, of greenhouse gases on the planet as a unit. Uh, it, it, and uh, 800 bases around the world, um, you know, um, they, and the budget keeps on growing and growing, and that represents a larger and larger footprint as well. And the Democrats and the Republicans always seem to happily agree on the defense bill. They just passed another one, and my representative, Rosa DeLauro, she always uh, consistently for the last several years has voted for the defense bill. You know, in 2020, when I first ran, she voted for the um, it was about 750 billion this year. Now she just voted for the 850 billion dollar bill, which I think is more than the Pentagon asked for. It always happens that Congress, Pentagon asks for a certain amount, and Congress says, "No, no, 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 you need more than that." Now, why would they? They do that because <laughs> they know where the money's going to go. They're they're helping out. Um, you know, you know, no, no, buy more of these, buy more of those because they're made in my state, you know, because that money's gonna come back to uh, contractors that are supporting me. You know, Raytheon is, uh, is one of the top supporters of Rosa DeLora. Well, Connecticut is a terrible state for that. I, I, you're looking at my own district, Joe Courtney's district. Um, you know, his idea of economic development seems to be you know, keep building submarines, and yeah. it, it kind of, you know, cuts off any more creative options for building a more sustainable economy here. So it's more and more a single industry, and all the other things, building housing or creating retail, is all geared towards the people who are building the submarines. And, you know, someday either we you know, the raw materials won't be available to build them or for political reason, they're, you know, we won't be able to afford to build them. And what's going to happen to the trickle-down effect of that piece of the economy that's so dominant just going away? I, I worry about that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, these other, uh, other programs would be more jobs per dollar, too. I mean, you use the when they've analyzed this, you know, all the, the money, well, look at the jobs you're creating. Well, you could create more jobs if you take that same money that's going into the Pentagon and invest it in, you know, in environmental renovations and, up, you know, updating our energy grid and system or education uh, or healthcare. So, you know, more jobs per dollar. So I'm all for jobs programs. I'm all for, you know, FDRs, um, yeah. jobs program, things like that, all for it. You know, there are people who, um, you know, if people need a job and the private market isn't supplying one and they want a job, why not, you know, have the federal government put them to work and have them doing something that's good for the country and remunerate them, you know, pay them. Yeah, <laughs> as, as it is, we are paying for the submarine jobs anyway, really because it's a single source contract with the federal government. So yeah. it isn't that that one is socialism and the other isn't. Yeah. They both kind of are. Um, yeah. I, so, um, you know, you talked about the problem of the two-party system. And I know if people go to the, your website, um, you present ranked choice voting as one of the ways to address a, and fix this issue. So let's talk about ranked choice voting. Sure. Now, I do have a slide. Do you want to start by just putting the slide up or? Sure. Okay. Ranked choice voting is a reformatting of the ballot. It changes the way the ballot looks. So now the viewer, the people at home can see yep. this on their screen. Yep. Um, yeah, so you can see that uh, instead of just picking one of the candidates, you rank the candidates, and that's why it's called ranked choice. So you rank, okay, uh, here's uh, six candidates on the left side. Who's my first choice? You indicate that in the first column. 
there, the blue column with the orange uh, heading, uh, they indicate that the second candidate down is their first choice. And then in the next column over, and the, with the green heading, uh, they've indicated with a, a circle that the fifth candidate down, the green candidate, uh, is their second choice. And they've indicated a third choice as well. And so this ballot, these ballots go in. Now say you're, what happens is um, these, these, these backup choices, these second and third choices are like backup votes. So if your first choice candidate um, is eliminated, uh, if they come in, say they, you really like them, but, it, and they were your first choice, but they were kind of a long shot according to the polls, and so you were on the fence, and this happens to people all the time. Should I vote for the, who I like most, or is it a wasted vote if, they're, if that person's a long shot? Well, this is the, pro this is the problem that ranked choice voting fixes, uh, because in this case, you can clearly indicate your support for that person, but if they do come in last, they're eliminated, and anyone, including you who voted for them, will still have a vote, and your vote, everyone still gets one vote, but now your vote, instead of, um, you know, now instead of being thrown away, so to speak, I don't like that term, but that's the term people use, um, your vote will go to your second choice. So, you know, the one classic example might be, you know, if, if Nader voters ranked um, Al Gore second, Maybe Al Gore would have won Florida, but you know there's also the the phenomenon of uh, like they when they polled Jill Stein voters, two thirds of them said if 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 there had not been Jill Stein on the ballot, I would not have voted. I would have stayed home. I think that was true with Nader as well. Yeah. I would like to see how that ranking would have worked with Ross Perot mm -hmm. in 1992 because although there was a fairly large gap between Clinton and Bush, I think it was like 44% or 43% and 37%. And Ross Perot had more than 15% of the vote. Mm -hmm. And it is possible that he swung the election towards, um, towards Clinton. Mm -hmm. And you don't hear that example that much, but it's much more likely than, um, th than the Nader one because like Jill Stein voters, yeah. I think they've interviewed Nader voters, and not three quarters, but maybe 30% would not have yeah. come to the polls at all. But ranked choice voting frees us from having to have any of these discussions. Right, right, we don't even, yeah. We have all these post-mortems like, oh, Jill Stein voters, if you'd only you know, voted this way, we would, would, we would have had this outcome, or you know, like, um, I mean, you can turn it around and people say, Oh, Hillary voters, you should have known that Bernie was had was better against Trump in the polls. And if we had just voted, yeah. if you just voted Bernie, we could have had a, a candidate who would have beat Trump. And but you know, it's all these recrimina recriminations. It's not talking about policy. It's not really fruitful democracy. It's all str about strategic voting. It's not about voting your mm -hmm. values. It's and we it sucks up so much of the oxygen in our political space, yeah. this kind of argument, and we can be done with it. So let's please let's be, be done, done with it and get, adopt ranked choice voting. You just vote your preferences, you, you vote your values. And I have one uh, more slide here, and this is a real um, Maine primary ballot from a few years ago, because Maine has adopted yes. ranked choice voting and uh, <laughs> In fact, I know you now when Lisa Savage was running for U.S. Senate, uh, what was it two years ago? Three yep. years, um, and she was saying, "Vote for me first. Vote blue number two. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the Democrats did not even acknowledge that she was in the race, and I think they would have done better if they had. Mm. So, but it, there are places where this is really uh, implemented. And I think after the gubernatorial uh, primary, I guess it must be, must have been four years ago when Stefanowski won uh, over many more mainstream and um, maybe respectable re Republicans on the ballot. I think we heard a little bit about 
how maybe the party primary should be ranked choice. You wouldn't, in a primary, you wouldn't have the problem we have with our Connecticut ballot that because of cross endorsement, people's names are listed twice and we'd have to really figure out how to make our ballot work. In a primary, that's not the case. Everyone mm -hmm. is the same party. They're in a line. They're, every name is only listed once. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I heard at the time that some Republicans um, were unhappy with the results. I think Stefanowski won the primary with less than 30 percent of the, close to 30 percent of the vote, but not quite 30 percent of the vote. So he certainly didn't have a mandate among Republican voters. Mm -hmm. But we don't, we'll never know which candidate might have been viewed favorably by at least half of the voters because we didn't rank it. Yeah, I, um, for anyone who doesn't know, you know, yeah, this is not just a, a proposal that the Green Party is trying to make a reality uh, out of nowhere. You know, this is established voting method that's been used for a hundred years in Ireland and for decades in Australia, and they love it. They, it's, it's established, and now we have it in Maine, now we have it in Alaska, now the Democrats are using it in their primary in New York. In, um, and you know, so there are several places in Utah, I believe, cities that have it, because it's a better system, because it's more representative, because it makes democracy better, because it allows for more than just two parties, because it allows you to vote for your values and vote your real preferences, and because it avoids the vote splitting problem, and because it changes the dynamics of elections. So instead of uh, two people just trying to tear each other down. You have multiple candidates trying to um, appeal to as broad a, a, sw a swath of voters as you can. You can't divide and conquer. You, right. You want to be, the, e even if someone's voting for someone else, you want to be the number two. Yes. E e even if they're voting f for someone else, you want to appeal to that voter in hopes that you might be their number two. So you can't go and attack their first choice as being the Antichrist anymore as being, you know, the the peril to the nation that's going to destroy our country. You have to <laughs> be a little nicer. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see where it would really contribute to both civility and more talk about the issues. You know, it wouldn't be feel so much like a sports competition. Mm -hmm. It would, and a bit of trivia. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1967, and my high school used the hair system, a ranked choice voting system oh. for class officers. Wow. And we students used to make fun of it. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I mean, none of us thought it was hard. And when people seem intimidated at the idea of ranking it, it's like, I did this when I was in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not that hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's not hard at all. I mean, you know, you can easily rank things in your order of preference. Um, it's not, you know, thinking of multiple elections, it's not too hard for It's me. probably easier than figuring out how to vote strategically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that really can get you tangled up in knots. You know, again, in Australia, they have two houses of, of legis two legislative bodies, an upper and a lower like us. And their lower one is ele elected and has been elected for decades with, um, ranked choice voting. And the upper one uses multi-member district ranked mm. choice voting, um, which allows for even more uh, diversity of, of political parties getting a seat at the table. It achieves um, more uh, that multi-member district, um, so you know one district that has three representatives, for example. But those representatives, through uh, a, a, a form of ranked choice voting, the ballot is the same. Uh, will achieve something of proportional representation. So, you know, if if the parties are all equally, if there's three parties that are the most popular parties in that district, maybe you'll get one of each from that district. And so it avoids that problem of being, oh, you know, I'm a blue dot in a red sea or I'm a red dot in a blue sea. Um, with proportional representation, um, you know, it matters if you go out go out and vote. You're going to be motivated to want to go out and vote because there's a better chance that your vote's going to matter. 
And, and we do, uh, we only have five minutes left. I just wanted to make a very quick point that, you know, we hear so much about voter turnout and trying to make voting accessible to people. And I'm all for that, you know, early voting and m making, you know, no excuse absentee. But the second part of voter turnout after you're making voting convenient is to make voting meaningful to people. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things that get people to vote. Either it, it's important to them and they can manage doing it. And, and, and the making voting meaningful part seems very often to be uh, excluded. So we have four minutes left. So um, let people know how they can learn more about you, uh, get in touch with you, help you with your campaign or? Sure. What? So I do have a website, justinforall.org, with the number four. Um, it's still something of a work in progress. I'm a, I'm a pretty busy person, <laughs> and, and I'm doing a lot of this all by myself. I don't have a web guru who's volunteering all their time. Everyone's busy, you know. But I have something of a website that's, and where people can donate and can get some information about the issues, can subscribe to my newsletter where I'll let people know if I'm going to be out at an event or just updating them of what's going on or if there's a new article that's out or a new interview like this interview. I'll let people know. Sure, we can put it up. It'll be up on YouTube by tomorrow. Yeah, and I'll let people on my newsletter know. I also, I'm on Twitter pretty much every day. And I really find Twitter very engaging. I like to talk with people who disagree with me or agree with me, either one. I'm not, I'm not a fan of these these, loot, these uh, you know, people bubbling themselves in and self-segregating. Um, I think we need to talk to each other and talk to people of different opinions and, and arrive at, uh, that's the way to progress. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, um, and I have an email too, uh, which you can find on the website, uh, justin at justinforall.org. So that's easy enough to remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Justin. I have to say I'm really glad that you're running. Uh, I think we need more and more of these voices. Yeah. Um, in the one minute we have left, because of your medical background, what should we be doing with this COVID thing? I know, it's like one minute. What should we be doing <laughs> with this COVID thing? <laughs> in the, in the, yeah. Well, um, you, know, I, I, you know, we're in a different place than we were a year ago. Uh, two years ago, we have a vac We have several vaccines, more becoming available. Vaccines with a lot of, um, you know, now time out in the, in in the um, in the market, so to speak, out there being used um, for people to 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 uh, monitor for effects and efficacy. I don't know. One thing I, I guess I want to say about the vaccines is that a lot of the headlines are misleading. They'll say vaccine wears off after uh, five months, you know, or wears off after three months. It doesn't completely wear off. Okay, I want to make, if you listen very carefully or if you read down to the fifth paragraph or if you listen to the viral, virological podcasts like I do, like TWIV, This Week in Virology, they'll explain to you that's supposed to happen. When you vaccinate someone, their antibody levels go up and their T cell responses, you can't really measure them very well, but they get they also have T cells. There's B cells and T cells, two parts of the immune system, two of the major parts of the immune system. But you expect the antibodies to fade over time. That's what's supposed to happen. But the immune system doesn't forget. You know, you have childhood immunizations. You don't need boosters every five years. You don't need boosters every 10 years for most things. That's because the immune system has a very long-term memory. And so that's why the original COVID vaccine is still protecting people from the current strain. The strain has not mutated enough that, it is, that the vaccine is useless now. The vaccine still has a high degree of efficacy protecting against the most serious outcomes of the illness. Well, thank you. I hate okay. to say it, but we are out of time. Okay. But, but, but that, was, that was somewhat encouraging. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. We'll get it up on YouTube and so more people can watch it. And thanks for coming to New London. Thank you, Rana. Thank you, Justin. <laughs>